I'm glad everyone's here. As always, I've got a captive audience for a little while. The door is that way if you do decide to flee before the message is over. But we'll be in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 11, and hopefully we're going to get through to verse 8 of chapter 21. So our study in Revelation, if you remember, it's called the time is near. The time is near. And the Bible says that the day of our salvation is nearer today than it's ever been. And trust me that if you just have to read, I don't know you even need to trust me, but if you look at the news and see the way the world's gone in the past few years, and just look a little bit at Revelation, even if you don't, people are starting to go, the world is kind of ending. You know, Vladimir Putin started to talk about nuke in the West. There's a rumor that uh, Xi Jinping, uh, there's been a coup in China. We'll see if that's true or not. Uh, and everything else going on. Uh, the, I mean, just go to the gas pump and you know the world is ending. Because <laughs> at least my world is ending when I go there. But the title of today's message is The Second Death. The Second Death. And that sounds a little bit funny, right? You know, usually you just die once, but there's a second death, and we're going to see that. If we remember in Revelation, uh, John, the Apostle John, was on the Isle of Patmos. He, uh, Jesus revealed himself to him and took him to heaven and showed him the future. We know that Revelation shows us the, the world as we, the end of the world, excuse me, as we know it, a time called the Great Tribulation. When we see the real climate change happened when the world gets destroyed, when cities are destroyed and God begins to judge the nations. Nations don't go on to the afterlife. People do. And the nations need to receive judgment in here. But I believe it's also truly a last-ditch effort of God to get people to turn to him. If we read that, we see that's clear. The gospel goes out. There's prophets. There's, there's times for that. But we know that most people don't. Most people don't. We saw the thousand-year reign last week that Jesus came on a white horse. Uh, he had his saints behind him. Uh, he locked Satan up for a thousand years. He showed the earth what a real utopia looks like. They had turned to the Antichrist, but Jesus came back and said, no, this is what a real leader is like. This is what a real godly kingdom is like. Uh, but after that, he let Satan loose, and foolishly, a bunch of the world went after them, and they were destroyed. But in Revelation, we see the end revealed, the church revealed, and don't feel like you got to take notes for these, but heaven's revealed, Jesus is revealed. The future is revealed. Today we're going to see the Father revealed, the books revealed, our works revealed, and ultimately as we uh, get to the end of the message into before next study, the new heaven and the new earth revealed. Chuck Missler, the late Chuck Missler said, the Bible says more about the end times than any other time in history. And we said that last week. That man, the Bible, if you look through it and look at the prophecies, it speaks more about the time of the end than any other time in history. And if the Bible says that, I don't know why we miss out on it. I don't know why we skip over it so much in Christianity. Maybe we're scared of it. Maybe we don't uh, understand it. But I think as, as we've studied through it and read through it, hopefully it's become a little bit more plain. And hopefully the Bible will explain itself. And, you know, the best judge of the Bible is the Bible. And we can look through and see how uh, it gives light to these things. And we're going to see that today. I've got a lot of verses to share, but I think that they give a better light to this than I could ever do. Uh, James 4, uh, 11 and 12 says, There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. And then I also, also want to read Psalm 46. I'm going to turn there before we get started. Psalm 46. And you don't have to turn there with me. It's a little tough to get there quickly, but it says, God is our refuge and strength, a well-proven help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though its mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her in the early dawn. The nations roared, and the kingdoms were moved, and he uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, see the works of the Lord, who makes desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts off the spear. He burns the chariot in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. And if you keep that in mind, as we read through this chapter and the next chapter in the next couple of weeks, I think, it'll, I think it'll bless you. Because remember that with Revelation, we like to think of it as the end. And it is. It tells about the end of the world. But I believe what Revelation really sets up 
is the beginning, is the new beginning, is the beginning of eternity. That for people who don't have Christ, who don't have Jesus, who haven't received his love and forgiveness, it is a bitter end. But for us as believers, it's a joyous beginning. You know, like uh, that song Amazing Grace says, it says, when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And God, we'd ask that, God, you would show us the beginnings you have for us. Even today, that the stuff that you have before us, God, we'd embrace the things that we've failed and have behind us. God, let us leave behind in you. But God, we look forward to your return. Uh, and God, anyone who's listening, uh, God, online or anywhere in the future, God, may they come to you and turn to you. And God, the people around us, may we be a light to them that they might know that you're true and escape this judgment that we're about to see. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's read Revelation chapter 20. And uh, we'll do uh, from verse 11 to 15 to start. So it says, uh, this is John speaking. He says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his face the earth and the heavens fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead and that were in it, and death and Hades delivered up dead were in them, and they were judged, each one by his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the fire. And as we looked at last week, this last, I mean, all of Revelation really is kind of information dense. It says a lot. And just a few verses. And you could read all this and I'd probably unpack it for days about the amount of things that it says there. And hopefully it won't take us days to get through today. But if we see, we see a great white throne judgment. And the one who sat on us, who sat on it, it's God. Obviously, we saw Jesus on the throne before. Timmy, sit down, buddy. Sit down, you're going to fall, bud. Uh, Jesus was on the throne before. But I believe, and even the commentary would say, that this is the fullness of the Trinity on the throne. That at God's judgment, God is fully revealed. Um, this, this seat uh, in, you know, this beam of seat for believers, there's kind of two judgments going on at this one time, as we'll look at in a bunch of different scriptures. But if you log it in your mind, the beam of seat was a place of judgment. It was the extension of the raised seat of the judge. You know, if you go to court, the, the judge is up higher. He's kind of got that whole uh, booth, pulpit, whatever you want to call it, where he judges from. Uh, it's described in the New Testament, Matthew, John. Uh, it was also the seat of the Roman emperor um, in Acts and of God in Romans 14. Uh, when speaking of judgment, that, that, that there's this place of authority where judgment comes out from. You know, when you go to trial, hopefully it's not at 7-Eleven. It's at the city courthouse or the state courthouse or a federal courthouse. There's a judge. There's security. There's a lot of times they have the laws written on the walls. I mean, I wouldn't know. I've never gone, you know, traffic tickets is about as far as I've gotten, thankfully. Um, but sincerely, there's a, a presence of authority, even the fact that they wear the robes and they have all this uh, around them, right? You can't even approach the judge, right? You have to get the bailiff to take the evidence of. The judge has to say, approach the bench, that there's a place of authority where judgment comes out of, and not everyone can get there, and not everyone sits in those seats. And what I like is that the Bible says, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I picture all, you know, if we look back of all of Revelation, we picture everything that happened, all the judgments, the things on earth, the things in heaven. And now all of a sudden, after the thousand year reign of Jesus, everything fl flies away. Maybe it's because, you know, I'm a 42, but I think of the Matrix, you know, I'm four, how old am I? 41? I don't even, I don't even remember. <laughs> but the Matrix, I remember, you know, when he first goes in the Matrix, all of a sudden, all the stuff like flies away and it turns to like a white screen and they're just kind of standing there and just kind of rushes away and then they get the guns and the, everything comes rushing back in. But I kind of picture that, that they're there and all of a sudden, all creation, everything, every atom, every molecule, every planet, every plant, every tree, whew, flees away from the presence of God. In 2 Peter 3.10, I believe this is kind of talking about the same time. It says, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. We've read this a hundred times, probably because I love it. But it says the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. 
both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And I believe that this is describing this period that we're looking at right now. And he says, therefore, because all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That because we know this, because it's all going to go away, doesn't mean that we, you know, live life and sit around lazy, you know, but that because we have our, uh, our sights adjusted to knowing what's coming, that we're not going to live for these things that are going to burn away anyway. In 1 Timothy 6.13, uh, Paul says, and he says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He's the blessed and only potentate, King of kings, Lord of lords, who alone has immorality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. I bring that up because he says, God dwells in unapproachable light. I picture it like this, that God is so powerful. God the Father is so amazing, right? That if any of us, who could stand in his presence? It'd be like trying to stand before a nuclear bomb. You're just going to get blown away. And God, in some sense, has hidden that aspect of himself from us that we might not be destroyed. And so instead, he sent Jesus, the image, the, uh, the visible image of the living God. That when Jesus came, God showed him himself in a package that wasn't going to destroy us. In fact, in a package, in a person that would save us. But at this time, I believe this is when God says, it's all revealed. And nothing can stand before him. The effects of sin in this broken world aren't going to be around. They can't stand there anymore. That God is fully revealed. Nothing is left hidden. There is no more mystery. There is no more wonder. There is no more question. And there's no place that any of this can hide. It can't run and hide. And thankfully for us, God says something about our sin in Psalm 103.12. He says, As far as the east from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions for us. That as believers, I believe our transgressions go that same way. Whew, flee before him. That there's this peeling away of everything in physical creation. And only people are left to stand before God. That only people. It's not your business. It's not your car. It's not your wealth. It's not your accomplishments. It's you standing before God. I imagine that to be quite a long line. <laughs> every person throughout history is standing in this line. Uh, you know, ever go to the DMV and you've got all your papers and you're waiting in line and you're a little nervous? Do I have all, do I have everything? You know, some of these new forms that they have, they get like different IDs. They have so many requirements and so many points to add up to get, you know, your passport or to get your real ID or whatever it is. And you go, do I have it all? I remember we tried to get our real ID years ago and then they got there and then they're like well it's laminated you can't use it it's laminated i'm like i've been using this thing laminated for 25 years i never had a problem today you know you get a little nervous do i have everything together i don't want to have to come back here and do this again but can you imagine that standing there and not being ready to see god you're in line i don't know how far back you are maybe it curves around maybe it's just a straight line but you see god all the way up there and you see your friends in high school you see your college buddies you see the people you work with. You see your brother. You see your sister, whoever it is. And you're going and your pockets are empty. You've got no money to judge the, bribe the judge. And even if you did, he's the richest person in existence. So it's, he doesn't want it. And there's no place to hide. You're looking around. I don't know if it's just the big white ethereal plane and there's no rock to get behind. There's no bushes to cover you. There's no camouflage. There's no, my kids are playing hide and seek yesterday. They're like grabbing up on the side of the, Ash's truck, like trying to hide so they can't see their feet. They're climbing underneath. Uh, but that was it. There's no place to hide. And don't we hide behind things in life, even as believers? Sometimes we hide behind good motives, right? The, the ends justify the means. Don't we have excuses? Isn't that the day and age of our time now is to blame someone else for our own lack or our own failings? Or our procrastination? I'll take care of it tomorrow. I'll worry about it later. You know, Jeremiah says in 17, 9, and 10, we know this verse, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately lick, uh, wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. And I think we skip this next verse because it says, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. 
We don't like that part. We like the first part. Yeah, okay, Lord, we're wicked. You know, you know us. But we conveniently forget that part that he'll give us according to our ways. That God will judge our hearts and give us according to the fruit of our doings. The Bible also says that today is the day of salvation. The day that we're in right now. To know Jesus is for today. Because tomorrow, it might not be tomorrow, it might be this afternoon, will be the day of judgment. That when you're standing in this line, it's not the time to go, okay, Jesus, I'm ready to believe you now. No kidding. Everyone believes him now. They're all standing in line in perfect full view of him without excuse. Because we're going to be judged truly for what we did with Jesus. Believing or unbelieving. That God says in Romans 1, he's given, there's no excuse. You look around at creation. People look around at creation and there's two views they come up with. One, nothing created everything. And through millions of years of death and dying, we were created. And your grandpa is a monkey. Or you look around and say, wow, God made this. There's a design to this. There's a purpose to all this. The way the planets spin, the way these things happen, could not have just happened. And again, it's not just our good works or our bad works, helping the old lady across the street, giving money to this charity. It's what we did with Jesus in our life. Was he the foundation or was he cast away? Luke 20 says, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to be powder. When Jesus says that, there's only two options for you and I. Be broken or be pulverized. That doesn't sound too much, like too much fun to me, right? You know, if you were going to go to, uh, if we went back to Silverwood and the ride was be broken or be pulverized, I'd say, I don't want to get on the ride either way. But that's the option, that either we're going to accept his judgment on our sin in this life and allow ourselves to be broken upon him, realize that our sin has already broken us, so we're broken to begin with. So the breaking of falling on him is really a good breaking. We fall down and worship him now. It breaks us. We lose our friends. We lose the things we used to care about. It costs us something in this life. But when we really consider it and consider the reality that we live in, None of what it, God costs us in this life, none of what God breaks off in this life is truly worth anything. Philippians 3, 8-11 says, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Can we say that? That we've suffered the loss of all things? I can't. And he says, I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, everything I had before, I was the smartest, I was looked up to, I was the most zealous, I thought I was obeying God the most. I don't want it anymore. Compared to Jesus, compared to the love he gives to me, compared to even dying the death that he died, I don't want it because he's worth everything to me. You know, there's that song that says, uh, man, I forget the line, but it talks about, you know, that anything we sacrifice for him, it's not a sacrifice. You think about what he did at the cross. If we truly understand the cross, even a little bit, why would we think that's a sacrifice to give up this little thing or that sin or this relationship or that pursuit? It's not worth it. God died for you and I. Why do we think anything else is worth it? Shouldn't we count it all as rubbish? Shouldn't we count it all as lost? That if I have, if I have this thing in my life instead of Jesus, I'm truly losing out. If I follow this thing in life as rich as I get, I'm truly poor and missing out. God is God or he's not. He says that there's the first set of books here. And these books have everything you've ever thought and done in it, I believe. Think about the amount of data big tech has on us, right? The Zoom call going to China, who knows what they do with it, right? It's why I don't use Gmail for important stuff anymore. The amount of data they have on us, look at how rich they are from giving us free services because they collect so much data on us. You know, Facebook could probably even tell when you're going to the bathroom and when your next habit is because of the way you use the service. Oh, remember, I think it was, was it Nancy Pelosi or one of those politicians when the 
came out about the NSA and the metadata. You're like, oh, it's just metadata. It's not, no, they can tell more about, your meta, about you from your metadata than if, even if they had your first name. But can you imagine again being in line and everything is playing before you? I don't know if it's an IMAX screen, right? And you're just, I'm so glad that when I was in junior high and high school, the video we had was VHS. And any videos of me doing stupid things is long gone in the, tr in the trash. Now kids post it online and they pull up tweets and Facebook posts from years ago and get people fired from their jobs. Can you imagine waiting in line and all the things you wanted to tweet, all the things you wanted to say in your heart are up there and then read aloud before everyone else? I kind of want to go last. Well, you know, there's no one behind me. All right, you can say whatever you want to say because no one else is going to see it. But Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. That you and I, each of us, will die in this body once. Maybe they'll resuscitate you and you'll come back, but when you leave this body for good, it's the judgment. You go before God and you're there. And again, thankfully, this is the beginning of eternity. I don't think it's going to take all of eternity to go through this list. I think it's going to be a very efficient and very proper manner that God goes through it and he's not going to belabor it. But what strikes me is that this really, this line, this standing before God, for anyone without Jesus at this resurrection before the second death, is truly the first part of hell for them. The first part of hell for anyone who doesn't have Jesus to cover their sins is them standing in line and having everything they've done laid out, laid bare, laid open before God. No excuses, no this, no my dad did this to me, my mom did this to me, it's the government's fault, it's this group of people's fault. No, you did this and it's clear and it's evident that it was your fault, you were sinful and you knew it. And more than that, I think God's going to show you all the times that he gave you to turn to him. Remember this time? Remember that time? Remember the time you almost died and you said, God, if you get me out of this and you... And then they're going to be judged. So I think there's going to be a bunch of people sweating and a bunch of people excited to get to the front. Because the first part of heaven for us is also standing in line in a sense. I know it doesn't sound very exciting. We get to heaven, we want to go to rejoice. I, th I think we might have that, you know, like when you go to the amusement park and they give you, I forget what they call it, fast pass, where you can cut the line and just get right on the roller coaster. I've been feeling it's going to be a little bit like that for us. But that's the first part of heaven for us, is seeing the fact that we are not being judged. In fact, we're being rewarded for our faith and our works that came from believing in Jesus versus our faith and our works that comes from not believing in him. 2 Corinthians 5 says, 9-11, through 11, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I also trust uh, all are well known in your conscience. It says, because we as believers understand the true terror of God, that although God does not want us to be afraid of him, God wants us to be able to come into his presence and be close to him and know him and be his friend and lean on him. We understand that who he is. That like we looked at a few weeks ago, he is God, he is absolutely holy, and he's absolutely just. And because we know the terror of that, and the only reason we escape that is because of the blood of Jesus, we want to compel others to escape that as well. Uh, look, you don't know who you're, who you're talking lightly of when you say the man upstairs. You don't know who you're talking lightly of when you use his name in vain. Understand that this God is holy and he loves you and the way you're headed is the way of death. Romans 14, 10 to 13. Why do you judge your brother? or Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause the fall in our brother's way. We don't want to stumble anyone. We don't want anyone to get before God and go, you know what, it was Tim's fault that I didn't believe. It was her fault that I didn't trust you that day. And again, God's going to go, yeah, that's, that's bad, and they're going to have to answer for that, but you still did what you did with it. So as believers, we need to remember that the judgment we are to have in this life is not to condemnation. 
We are not the one on the behemoth seat. We are not the one on the great white throne judging others the condemnation. You're going to go to hell and there's no hope for you. Instead, we're saying you're on the way to hell, but there is hope for you. That our judgment uh, is one of discernment between right and wrong, of correction to lead others to life, not to approve of the things they do unto death. Oh, we shouldn't judge anyone. We need to be so loving and caring and just let them go on and do their things and not ever tell them that it's wrong because that would hurt their feelings. They might call us a bigot. It's hateful to tell them what they're doing is wrong. No, it's hateful to know the terror of God and then not tell them that what you're doing is going to lead you to hell. What you're doing is not okay. I don't hate you for it. I don't approve of it because I know what it's doing to you and I know what it's going to do to you eternally. But there's a difference there. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 17. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and other builds on it. But each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay with that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, for each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Um, if what he built endures, he receives a reward. If it's burned, he will suffer a loss, but he will help himself be saved, yet as through fire. You know that as believers, believing in Jesus is the only thing we need to get to heaven. And it's not even our work. We just go, okay, this happened. It's true. I, know, I understand you, you love me, God, and I accept it. There's no really work involved in that. But from there, the things we do in our life, is it based on that or not? If it's based on that, it will survive the judgment fire and God will reward us for it. And if not, well, we'll still get there. But we're just not going to have any heavenly inheritance, so to speak. And I, this is a, a topic I don't want to go off on a side rail on. In some sense, we'll all have equally overflowing cups in heaven of joy. But I think some people's cups are going to be bigger and some will be smaller based on what makes it through. Now, can I figure out who's going to have the bigger cup? No, because God judges the heart. God knows the motive. The one who I think has the biggest cup, maybe, might have the smallest cup. The one who I think might have the smallest cup might have the biggest cup, like the widow's mites, right? She put in two pennies, but she gave all that she had. And a quote from the commentary says, There is a second and higher life, so there is also a second and deeper death. And as after that life, there is no more death, so after that death, there is no more life. And again, it's sobering, to realize that there's a record of everything, that God doesn't miss a thing. In Matthew 6, you can read it later, 1 through 6, he says, make sure when you do your, your charitable deeds, make sure when you pray, you do it in secret, because the God who sees in secret will reward you openly. People go on TV and they're like, I'm giving away a million dollars. And everyone's like, yeah! You know, the guy, was, is it Patagonia? Uh, I, he just gave away like a big chunk of his company for billions of dollars. And the whole world's like, yeah, he always giving it to, to stop climate change. Bro, read Revelation. It's not going to stop nothing. <laughs> but he's getting his reward now. He stands before God. God's going to go, that, that did nothing. No one got saved because of that. And so especially as believers, make sure we do it in secret and God will reward us openly. The seed, death, and Hades delivered up the dead that were in them. And that's an interesting picture. It reminds me of the flood. God's not necessarily talking about the flood here, but he says the sea give up all those. And what was the first major judgment on all the earth? It was the flood. It was the flood. All those who died in it. Not that they're in the sea waiting, you know, uh, like that movie, uh, whatever, the Pirates of the Caribbean, all the dead pirates, whatever. But the sea was a frightening and unknown and powerful place to ancient people. It still kind of is. I remember going out on a, a cruise ship, barely off the coast with my wife on our honeymoon, and just how dark it was at night. And, you know, you fall off the boat then, <laughs> there's probably not much hope for you, let alone out in the open sea or in the North Atlantic during the winter. You see these videos of the boats going up and down, and I don't know how they don't break in half. And I don't know how anyone says, yes, give me money and I will go on that boat. I don't think you could pay me enough to do that. But it was also a vast ocean of wonder, you know, not knowing what was beyond, right? The earth is flat. Columbus sailed the ocean blue and he discovered America. <laughs> you know, there are people here already. Um, I think of it as space in our time. You know, it's this dangerous, wondrous place. But uh, the commentary talks about why does the sea give up its dead? Because it represents a place of unburied bodies. You know, you fall over overboard, no one's going to find you. 
The emphasis is on the char universal character of judgment. It's for everybody. And it also says, the Bible says, that death and Hades are done away with. The, the hell that we know about is cast into the final hell, the lake of fire. And we talked about this the other week, so I won't get into it, but the different parts of hell, and there's a final hell, and that's the lake of fire. And even death is thrown in there. That God says, I don't want anything to do with death anymore. Death was never supposed to be. It was not a part of my creation. It's a result of sin, and I'm getting rid of it completely. But there's only going to be life going forward. And unfortunately, there's only going to be life of eternal dying in torment for those in the lake of fire or eternal life to those in paradise. We see Hades, this is a place of torment until the judgment is done, like we talked about. That's done away with. And I believe in a sense, you know, and again, you know, I'm, I'm taking maybe a sliver, a facet of maybe what, uh, of a, a, what God is like. But I believe in a sense, God wants nothing to do with hell. That God didn't want to make it, in a sense, he kind of had to make it to deal with it, right? None of us really enjoys having a trash can. Oh, I can't wait to go out and see my trash can. But we all have a trash can because that's where we need to get rid of the trash in. And so we have it out of necessity, not because, I mean, maybe you go find a nice kitchen can. Go, oh, isn't this great? It's going to go with our de decor. But God doesn't think that way about hell. He's not like, yes, I love having hell and I love having heaven. I love putting people in hell and I love putting people in heaven. He doesn't. If you remember... The only reason you go to hell is because you chose it. Because God enjoys blessing people. God enjoys taking care of people. I believe in a sense he doesn't enjoy I mean, destroying people, judging people. But as part of his righteousness, that's what he must do. If God must do anything, if you understand what I'm saying. But there's no place for anyone to flee from God, and there's also no place for sin in heaven. So sin and its effects and the place of its end have to be done away with, have to be separated from heaven. And when God judges, it's just and right and true. But again, I don't think that's what he lives for. When Jesus came, he didn't read that part in Isaiah about judging. He said, I've come here to save you, right? He'd rather reward us. When God judges us, he's merciful, he's kind, he's gracious. He'd rather give us what we don't deserve in reward than give us what we do deserve in hell. And what's scary here is that it says anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I'm not famous. I never will be. <laughs> I don't know anyone who's truly famous. Other than, you know, my brother's been on TV a couple times, so maybe he's famous. But famous people sometimes have a guest list to get into a club or an event. And if your name's not on that list, you're not getting in. Well, I don't think many of their names are in this book. And it's scary that all it takes is your name being in this book, separating you from jumping in a big thing of lava or going to an eternal party. That we're all going to be resurrected from the first death. That Again, we die in this life. We're resurrected here. And we're either going to live for eternity in the lake of fire or we're going to live for eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. And I believe that there's a, a gulf fix that no one can pass between these two things. These things are final. This judgment is final. There's no appeals court. There's no coming back in six months. There's no getting out on good behavior. This is it. This is the end of everything of our time. And John 5, 28, 29 says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And that should be sobering. It should be sobering that there's a resurrection to condemnation. That we're all found in some way in these books. That your name is in the book of history, whether you like it or not. Whether you had a statue or not, whether you were famous in the world's eyes or not, they say history is written by the conquerors, right? Or the people who won. But God wanted the cross. And his books detail history accurately as it is. Not billions of years, but your years. And, there's no, and if there's no cross, you know, they look in these books, the piles of the books, they flip through, they find the things you've done, and then they flip through the book of life. Okay, you're not in here. You're going over there. Oh, you did all this, but oh, look. Oh, you're in this book. Okay, so you're going over here. 
That should be sobering. I think that's another reason why we skip Revelation, because we don't like to think about that. We like think, oh, God is good, and he's fun, he's holy, we go to church, we have our club, we have our friends. Oh, I'll go evangelize, I'll do a bake sale. And all that stuff's well and good. All that stuff's, it's nice to have a good church life and a church family and fellowship and do the nice things that we've been afforded in our society to be able to do. But the reality is, reality is a lot stronger than that, more terrifying than that. The people not found are going to be burning in torment forever. And I think the worst part about hell is it's not the fire. It's not the worm that eats. It's not necessarily the darkness or the falling or any of these other things that the Bible describes. But remembering and knowing full well that you had every chance to choose Jesus. And you said, nope, don't want him. Nope, get him out of here. I've got my own way. And you're going, I was wrong. It was right there the whole time. And just this, ah, separation. And knowing you'll never get out of it. But God is faithful. And that's why this is written. Because God doesn't want anyone to perish. And that's not just die. We all die, right? Even believers die. Paul died. That's not the parish he's talking about. It's this parish. And let's go on. Verse 21. Um, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven and from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Look, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be uh, his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Neither shall there be any more sorrow, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. It says the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And the Bible has three words for heaven, or heaven means three things. It means the sky, it means outer space, and it means the dwelling place of God. So that's what's passed away, the sky and the universe and the earth have passed away. And in a sense, I can even think that maybe even the dwelling place of God that, you know, because Satan had been there before, that somehow there's a new version of that, but I don't want to, you know, that's just conjecture, right? But what we're in now, this creation, this world has burned up. It's passed away. It's fled from the presence of God. It no longer exists. It's been destroyed. Science believes in a big bang. As it's been said, I believe in a big bang too. Theirs comes at the beginning. Mine comes at the end. <laughs> Bam. It's gone. You know that this is it. The Bible says there's a creation in a literal six days. There's not a gap theory, not a previous creation that Satan fell in and then Adam was created. This is it. This is it. And it's gone. But God is, like we talked about earlier, whenever God destroys, it's not for total destruction. Whenever God destroys, it's to bring in something that's better. Whenever God takes away, it's to give something that's better. And he gives something that's far better. Even as amazing as our reality is, he brings in a far better one. And he says that there's no more sea. And I think that's interesting because if you read Genesis, it seems that there's one great sea, right? And then the, uh, they were divided and then the earth came forth. And I think technically, if you think about it, there's still one great sea on the earth. We just call it different names by which piece of land it borders. You know, the Pacific is connected to the Atlantic, which is connected to the Indian, and it's all these arbitrary borders. But he says that there's no sea there too. And again, from the commentary, it talks about to the Jewish mind, the sea was a place of separation and evil. And already in the book of Revelation is shown to be the source of the satanic beasts in chapter 13 and the place of the dead in chapter 20. In other areas of scripture, the sea is associated with the heathen, Isaiah, and in a more general sense with the opponents of the Lord that must be conquered in Psalms. That the sea, as wonderful as it is, if you think back to the flood, it's a remnant of God's judgment. That the world did not, you know, it, there's all different theories and we could talk about that another time. But the ocean was not the way it was, I believe, before the flood. That a lot of it's left over from the flood. And God doesn't want any remembrance of that. He doesn't want people in heaven going, oh, look at the ocean. Even if they don't remember, he knows. And if we think for a second about the wonders of a new creation, that God doesn't give us a day-by-day -day account here. You know, was it created in an instant? Was it a separate event, just not outlined in Scripture? Remember, God only gives us what we need to know to tell the story of salvation. Uh, but... Has it been what Jesus has been working on for the past 2,000 years? 
He says, I go to prepare a place for you, right? We're seeing the new Jerusalem. Now for 2000 years, Jesus has been tinkering away with his tools in the garage, so to speak, making the new creation, making the new heavens, making the new Jerusalem. And if God made this in six days, imagine, so to speak, what he could do in 2000 years, the type of experience we would have, the senses we would have, the smells, the tastes, the things that we can't even imagine. We couldn't even speak of it. If, even if we had language to do it, Paul said it would be unlawful to do it. And this is the fullness of God. That this creation is but a shadow of the things that come. We see New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. We're going to see this more in depth next time. Um, but it's quite amazing. It's actually quite sci-fi, quite weird when you look at it. I think that's why we skip over Revelation 2. Because it says some weird things in it. But man, don't we want God's kingdom to come, his will to be done? Isn't this where we're living for? The Bible says that we're sojourners in this life, that we're just passing through. Well, where are we passing through to? It's not to Kentucky. You know, this world is a rest stop. You know, we passed by a rest stop the other day. You know, it's great when you're on a, lo- on a long road trip to stop at a rest stop, get some snacks, you know, take a break, stretch, go to the bathroom if you have to. But you don't really want to live there. It's probably not a pleasant thing to do to live in that parking lot next to a big rig idling for all eternity. You're just passing through. And that's what this life should be to us. That we find rest here. We find what we need here to get through this life. But we're not. My friend's moving across the country right now to Michigan. I don't know why I go to Michigan, but he's got a good job there. But he's not going to send all his stuff to a rest stop. He's going to send it to his new house. And as believers, we should do the same thing. If we believe as believers, that all of God's word is true, we should be living for the next life. Where are we storing up our treasures, Jesus said? Is it for this life? To spend all your quarters in the vending machine at the rest stop? Or are you putting them in God's tide box, so to speak, in your good works, in your faith, in trusting Him, in reaching others? That when you get there, your reward is not a quarter, but your reward is, oh, my friend was there. Oh, my dad was there. Oh, my coworker's there. All these people I don't even know are there because somehow they found out through the gospel through my life. That's our reward in heaven. Who cares about this stuff in this life? God's got it all made for us. He has every need concern for us. So what is our reward in our next life? It should be the people that we've spread, shed the gospel to, or yeah, share the gospel to, right? And then we hear another voice coming down from heaven as we're going to close here, hopefully quickly. But remember all the voices throughout Revelation proclaiming judgments? I think this is the voice they were all waiting to. Like, no, 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 I get to do it. No, 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 I get to do it. <laughs> you know, I don't, know if the, I don't think they're fighting, but if they were, this is what they'd probably be fighting to say. That this voice comes from heaven with a better message. And it says, The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. No more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. The former things have passed away. What a message to proclaim. You know, the tabernacle, right? The system of sacrifice and the temple and the priesthood was all a picture of Jesus and of heaven. It was as if someone was backlighting heaven and it shone down to earth and this was the form of worship we had. And then there was even one in heaven. But what does God want to do with us? He wants to dwell with us. Emmanuel, right? God with us. That this is God's desire for us, that we'd be his holy temple, he'd live within us, but ultimately he wants to live in paradise with you and I forever. And he can't do that in this world. As great as a thousand year reign is going to be, it's tainted, it's ruined. The whole creation groans under sin. And these things have passed away, they're gone, they're not ever to be dealt with again. And in some sense, there's no memory of them anymore. But, you know, obviously the voice mentioned it, people are like, what is he talking about? No, they knew exactly what he was talking about. So somehow there's a memory of this life without it being tainted and weighed down by sin and tears. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. That when we get to heaven, we're going to know everyone perfectly. And we're not going to know them based on their status in this life, based on their skin color, their wealth, their, the things they did wrong. We're going to know them for who they are in Jesus and know them completely. I'll know you're my mom. I'll know you're my dad. We'll all know each other for how we know each other, but it's not going to be weighed down with the burdens of the sin. Somehow it's going to be stripped of that and we're going to know each other perfectly. Like we talked about last week, like with Mima, right? We're going to know the people that we are married to in heaven, but we're not going to be married to them 
in heaven like we are on earth. Marriage is not in heaven the way it is on earth, the Bible says. Instead, we're all going to be married to Jesus. To Jesus. And as we close, let's look at the last couple of verses because he's got a new home for his bride. And verse 5 says, He who is seated on the throne said, Look, I'm making all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And we've seen that elsewhere in Revelation as well. Verse 6, He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. I will give the spring of the water of life to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their portion in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. And it's interesting that after all this, getting talking about heaven, that Jesus speaks a whole paragraph about the people who aren't going to get there. And again, it's because he wants John to write these down that we might know it now, ahead of time, that when we get in that line, we're prepared. We're ready. He says, I make all things new. That this is the first word of God in the new creation, so to speak. He makes all things new. And what does the Bible say? We are uh, made new in Jesus, right? Behold, old things have passed away. All things are made new. But it's made new. It's made better. Sin is not going to happen again. It's not this recursive thing where sin, another angel falls and another creation falls. It's not going to work that way again. Because everyone's had an opportunity to choose. Satan and the angels who fell had their opportunity and their judgment was set when they fell. When, the, when earth and sin and man fell, we had our opportunity then. When the thousand year reign came and then at the end of the thousand year reign, God let Satan loose. He gave people one last opportunity to choose him or not. So the people in heaven, the angels who made it to heaven are there because they want to be. They're because they know the goodness of God they taste it and they've seen and they don't want anything else. Because he says that it is done. That should remind you of when Jesus said it is finished on the cross. That all the work of God is done. In a sense, this is the eternal rest. That all of creation, that all the, his making, all his doing, all his working in salvation, all his judging, it's over. And it's time to enter into our Father's rest. You know, and again, like I said, somehow that this word is being recorded, John is to write it down because it's God's desire that we miss out on the judgment and we receive the reward. He says there's a fountain of water for everyone. If you remember the woman at the well, what did he say to her? I have water. Once you drink of, you'll never thirst again. She says, sir, give me this water. I'm sick of coming down here and pulling up a bucket every day. But as we close, uh, the, looking at this interesting list, and again, there's so much here we could spend days unpacking it, so forgive me where I've fallen short on this, but he talks about the cowardly. And this word cowardly is timid and fearful. And is it wrong to be timid? I don't know. I mean, some people are shy, and I don't necessarily think that's wrong. But in a sense, I think this is the person who thought God to be a hard man and buried their talents, like in that parable, right? Oh, God's, oh, I'm not going to do anything for the Lord. Because remember, Jesus said, uh, the, Paul says, perfect love casts out fear, and fear involves torment. The unbelieving, these are the unfaithful, those not to be trusted. People have said, God's not faithful, I'm not going to trust him, I'm going to do my own thing. The abominable, it's almost like this progression, cowardly, unbelieving, and then abominable. It means to render foul, both foul in life, and I believe also those who consider the cross foul. People out there in the world today who consider Jesus, who consider dying on the cross, who consider anything godly to be foul and disgusting and nothing they want to do with and out of the schools and what do they bring in? Stuff that is foul. It's those people. Murderers, that's pretty obvious. This word whoremongers in the Old King James, the Greek word is pornos. And that should be clear to us. People who are involved in those activities. Sorcerers. This one can be tough for our day and age. It's called pharmacaeus. It's, not, it's drug use. It's not necessarily going and getting your Advil from the pharmacist, right? But that's where their pharmacist comes from. But it's this idea of drug use and the spiritual things associated with it. Idolaters and liars. All these awful things. You're like, I haven't done any of that, God. And he goes, liars. Okay. <laughs> you got me there. But he says, God hates lying and lying lips. Like, God hates that. That in God's eyes, not telling the truth is just as bad as these other things. It says that they have a part in the lake of fire. And I like that it means a part due or assigned to one, but it also means destiny. That this is their chosen destiny. You choose these things, 
the end is the lake of fire. And as we close here, like Proverbs 7.27 says, her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. Remember that God doesn't want judgment for anyone. That he wants all people, especially the people of these lifestyles, because if we're honest, this was us before Jesus, that Christ died for the ungodly and for the sinner while they were in sin, right? He doesn't want any of these people to end up there. But he's honest and says, if you do this and choose this, this is your end. But there's a way out. There's a way out of the second death. There's a way into his reward. There's a way to be his children. And 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And as we close, we've been listening to this guy a lot lately, and he's quirky, but he says something at the end of his uh, teachings all the time. He says, what are you doing for God? What are you doing for him? If you're a believer, what are you doing for him? You've been saved. You understand the cross. You know what happened to your sin. Are you living for him? Are you serving him? Are you ready for him? And not that God needs you to do any of that, but why would you not? And God, we ask that, Lord, you would help us get our lives right wherever we are with you, God, that whether we've been doing good or we've been doing bad, God, that we would get right with you and trust you for everything we need. And God, for those around us that don't know you, God, would you help us speak the truth in love and get them on the right path, or at least try to, God, you're the only one who can really get them going, but God, help us share in our life and our words, and God, help us be busy about your business and be ready for your return, that you'd find faith on the earth, God. So come soon, we pray, and God, most of all, thank you that you are a God who's merciful and doesn't want to have to judge us and has given us every imaginable way out. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So may God bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you. There is a vineyard of the Lord. There is a vineyard for our soul. With all our troubles left behind the door, we drink first light until